The Spin-Off Podcast Network. This is Kiwi is back for a brand new season with more inspiring kōrero from special guests including rugby player, father and role model TJ Peronara. My family bring me joy. Rugby brings me joy too, but it's not the same joy as my family brings me. And global dancer and choreographer Kirsten Dodgen. For some reason people think I'm very intimidating. Listen to the new season of This Is Kiwi, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in collaboration with Kiwi Bank. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. Hello for lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spinner. If you have the means, consider supporting our high-quality journalism by becoming a Spinoff member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz/donate. Nair is public interest journalism funded through New Zealand on air. Behind glass cabinets or sitting in dusty basements in museums and art galleries across the world are over 16,000 Taonga Māori. Looted, stolen or traded in the early colonial period, the artefacts have spent the best part of the last two centuries far from the land that birthed them, the hands that crafted them and the people who held them. However, more and more of our Taonga are coming home. Just this week, 64 Māori and Moriori Koiwi were repatriated from Vienna's Natural History Museum, that's in Austria, to Te Papa, where they are welcomed back with a porphyry. A large majority of these Koiwi were stolen by an Austrian grave robber, Andreas Reischek, in the mid to late 1800s. However, there are still many more, particularly Toi Moko or Moko Mokai, held overseas. There are several being held in the British Museum as we speak. These preserved heads were heavily traded during the early colonial period and seen as a prized possession. During the musket raids, slaves and prisoners were killed so that they could be turned into toimoko, and many iwi trying to obtain weapons to fight back against the colonialists offered toimoko of their enemies to European and American traders. It's truly wild, and to be honest, quite disturbing, a little bit sickening to think that this was only 200 years ago and that sadly the whereabouts of so many of these mokomokai are still not known, with many of them believed to be held in private collections. However, thanks to the mahi of the Karanga Aotearoa repatriation programme, which was established by Te Papa in 2003, slowly but surely our ancestors and taonga are coming home. So far, the program has returned over 600 koewi, toimoko and taonga to hapu and iwi. They're very slowly but surely being tracked down, their return negotiated and then reunited with their descendants. Then there are also our taonga, Mereponamu, Kākahu, Korowai, Taiaha, Whakairo, that were also shipped across to the other side of the world. Hinemihi, which is one of the oldest surviving whānui in the world, built in 1880 in Te Wairua, sits on the Onslow family property in southeast England, near Surrey. But just last month, it was agreed that carvings from Hinemihi were to be brought home to the descendants of Hinemihi in exchange for new carvings. It appears that every week there's a new news report about some of our taonga coming back from European museums. And from these reports, it would seem that maybe the tide is turning, that these cultural institutions are slowly rectifying the error of their ways and realising that the people whose taonga their ancestors stole should be back on their home soil. In light of the recent death of the Queen, there appears to be a growing societal awareness and, to be honest, disgust with the hoarding of Indigenous taonga in colonial European museums. And so after the break, we're honoured to be joined by two of those who have the enormous task of doing this mahi. So stay with us. Kia mai. Kia mai. Tinaratato anō. Uh, we are absolutely honoured to be joined by two of the hard-working kaimahi at Te Papa who are bringing our taonga and koiwi home. Uh, so firstly of uh, Ngāti Awa, Tūhoi, Ngāti Makino, Ngāpui and Te Arawa, we have Te Arikirangi Mamaku Ironside. Uh, he is the kaituhu tohu koiwi tangata. 
the acting head of repatriation. And we're also joined by Amber Aranui of Ngati Kahununu and Ngati Tufari Toa, who is a researcher for the Karanga Aotearoa repatriation program at Te Papa. Tēnā kōrua, no mai, haramai ki a ne. Kia ora. Kia ora. So briefly, I think it would be really helpful for, for those of us, including myself, who don't know a lot about the, the area that you both work in. I'd be starting with you, Amber. What is your mahi about um, with the Karanga repatriation program at Te Papa? Um, oh, kia ora. Thank you. It's a, it's a very good question. Um, I Maybe I just sort of preface to say that I'm no longer in the program, but I was um, the researcher for um, Karanga Aotearoa Repatriation Program for maybe about 11 years. Um, and so when I was doing that mahi, my role was to um, assist our, our small team of, of three to find out where our tupuna uh, are around the world. Um and then to follow up on that research, so to find out how they got there, when they got there, who brought them there, and actually where they were taken from so that we are then able to take them home to their people, their iwi, their whanau, their hapu. Wow. I, I think that mahi is, is a bit of um, detective work. I like to think of myself as a bit of a detective. <laughs> and, um, and it's not easy. And, and, and it can take years sometimes. Um, to be able to find out the information you need to ensure that those tupuna go home to their people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, really keen to hear more about that process and how you, you know, how it takes years to track down um, some of these taonga and kuiwi. But we'll just quickly throw back to you, um, Te Arikirangi. Um, so what's what does your role entail at Papa? <clears throat> so uh, I, I started with the program at Te Papa here in 2009, uh, so just a couple of years after Amber had started. Um, and we, we started at a, at a very, uh, very interesting time in our program that had actually started probably in, in 2003. Um, and Karanga Aotearoa has, has, three, uh, has four main kaupapa and that's to uh, undertake provenance research uh, for tūpuna and foreign collections and also identifying where they come from, uh, but also to facilitate a negotiation process for uh, all these tūpuna to come home where, wherever they are, whether they be from um, institutions like uh, museums, uh, but also uh, universities and uh, anatomical uh, ana- anatomy departments uh, at these universities there. Um, and a big part of our part of our kopapa is to uh, to also negotiate uh, and speak with iwi hapu and whānau where these tūpuna come from and uh, provide them with all of the information that they require to make some decisions on how and when uh, these tūpuna come home and where they actually go go back to. And then um, the last main part for our program is to uh, facilitate that physical repatriation there. And so all of the handover ceremonies, as well as all of the uh, transport requirements, all of the freighting requirements. So for most of my time at Te Papa, it's just been around coordinating all of the logistics, working on the communications and, and some of the um, information management. For, uh, for, our, uh, for our very, very, very small team, of which Amber played a very, very significant part of. And, um, and, it's, and it's beautiful to see her evolve into another area, especially at Te Papa, um, and developing a framework for Tonga and Tonga repatriation. Mm. So you're still at Te Papa, Amber, but you've just oh. moved into a different part of the repatriation program? Uh, no, I've moved into um, curatorial practice now, so I'm... Um, uh, 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 the newest member of our uh, Mātauranga Māori curatorial team, we? Where, where we look after Tonga. Um, and a big part of the work that I'm doing within that team um, is one, to find out more about the Tonga that we have and to try and reconnect them back to um, iwi, hapu and whānau, um, but also to um, help facilitate the return of significant Tonga that are in our collections um, and and return them home too, which is amazing. Very similar mahi. It's just going from Kuiwi to um, to Tonga. Mm. Kapai. And so, just recently, as in you know, just this weekend gone, you were both um, involved with bringing back uh, sixty four of our uh, Maori and Moriori ancestors. Um, I'm going to start with you, Amber. Were you sort of part of the team which? track down um, these tipuna and and how did you 
Yeah, where, how, where did that come about? I, my understanding, this has been 20 years in the making, so, you know, where did that begin? Yeah, um, these tupuna are part of a much larger number of tupuna that were, um, most of which were collected by um, Andreas Rasek. He was Austrian taxidermist by trade, and, he, you know, he has a very interesting story coming here to Aotearoa. He was actually only supposed to come for two years, to help uh, set up the Canterbury Museum and ended up staying for 12, um, much to the disappointment of his wife and newly born child. Um, but, yeah, his story is, I think, for me, quite shocking because he had a diary and, and he wrote down the things that he did. Um, and so I think us in, here in Aotearoa uh, have known about his escapades maybe um, for quite a number of years so probably since the 1950s actually um, when parts of his diary were uh, published in our local newspapers and you know and that's when we found out that he had um, stolen well over 60 I think tupuna um, maybe in the hundreds and sent them back to Austria uh, initially to be part of um, the Imperial Museum collection there and then, you know, some of those tupuna have ended up in the US um, and luckily we've brought those home. Um, and we've also done another repatriation. Um, I can't remember when that was, Te Arakirangi, can you? 2015. Oh, 2015 mm. um, from the Ethnology Museum in Vienna. And so all of these tupuna all were part of that larger collection that he had amassed um, and, and and sent over to Austria. And, you know, it was quite shocking um, to read the things that he did and the links that he went to to obtain our tupuna and, and taonga to become part of, of the collection and, I guess, to uh, increase his status um, in Austria. And that was the perception at the time. Um, unfortunately, by the time he got back to Austria, the man who had promised him this status and this mana had died and, yeah, so it's a bit of a sad story for him, or a bit of utu, I think. Right, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, in, terms of, in terms of what he did. And so, yeah, so we, had, we have known about this story for quite a long time. And it's only been probably in the last seven or eight years that countries like Austria have become open to having conversations with us um, mm. about about returning our tupuna. Um, prior to that, it was quite difficult to sometimes even get an answer from them once we once we emailed them. Uh, but Te Ara Kirangi will be able to talk to you more about that. Yeah, what is that shift? Why do you think that... Because that kind of is how it appears from the outside, right, that there's quite a lot of our people coming home and Taonga coming home. But why, I guess, in this case, were Austria all of a sudden open to, to negotiating the return of our people? Um, I, don't, I don't think it's, um, it's a matter of um, all of a sudden, you know, like they, they were just hospitable towards, uh, towards Māori and, uh, and our claims for our tūpuna to actually come home. Um, and there has been a very, very steady, ongoing campaign that's actually gone through so many different generations of Māori. And, you know, even going... going uh, far back to uh, Queen Tarangikahu when she went over to uh, to Austria to uh, to retrieve uh, Tupu Tupaho, um, the Toimoku of Tupaho, and take him back to Topirimonga. So um, it even started even 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 before that. But you know the the interesting thing about the attitude for the government, which has shifted massively, is that there was there was a time when when we went to to Austria to uplift our, our tupuna, and part of it, part of the conditions for the return of Tupahu was that we weren't to ask for the rest of them back. Um, you know, and that's 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 the very very crass nature of uh, of, of all of this. But you know, the wheels really started turning, um, and probably between two thousand and nine and two thousand and two thousand and thirteen. So in two thousand and nine, the Austrian government had initiated a research project into all of their collections uh, of Kowiwi at the Natural History Museum as well as the uh, Ethnographic Museum um, to get a better understanding of uh, the collectors associated where they actually came from. With the expectation that for Māori anyway, we'd actually have a little bit more information and research and provenance around the Raishik, uh, the tūpuna that Raishik had stolen. 
but that wasn't actually the situation, and and um, nothing actually really be- eventuated for for Karanga Aotearoa, which had started in two thousand and three. Uh, there, but um, I think it was in two thousand and thirteen, two thousand and fourteen, when uh, acting Kaiho to Ronda Paku had gone over to to Vienna to speak with both the uh, Waltz Museum in Vienna and the Natural History Museum to actually start having that conversation again. Um, and then in 2015, uh, we were pa- repatriated from the Ethnographic Museum, the Welt Museum, uh, to Puna that Reichek had stolen from caves in Kafia. And these were the remains of, um, they, they were connected to Ngāti Hikairo, uh, around the very, 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 very sensitive. And so these, these collections, these recollections in Reichek's um, diaries that, that actually talk about the insidious nature of the theft and, and going into these and even bribing Fano. Um, all these, all these who knew where the Wahitapu were to help him get access into those into those caves, and that's that's where it actually started from there. And so we we managed to actually bring those back home uh, in 2015. And then you know it's a huge fucker papa. It's a really really large fucker papa story around how we actually got to what happened um, over last weekend uh, on Sunday the second uh, of October. Um, so 2017, two kaumātua from Tainui, Taki and Rato Tūna, went with a small delegation from Te Papa, uh, Te Riki Eki e Heroini and uh, Moana Parata, to speak with the Natural History Museum to hopefully move forward the, the, the wheels for them to actually release our tūpuna. And so... <clears throat> That same year, they had a new uh, head of international collections, Professor Dr. Sabine Eggers. And uh, she's a uh, German by descent, but uh, raised, in, uh, raised in Brazil. But, you know, like very, very, very well educated. And he paitana hanga, he ngako maha kitana, because she actually encouraged the museum, the Natural History Museum, to undertake a, a research project to have a look again at Reichek's diaries, go through the transcripts, retranslate them again, because, you know, Reichek's son, who actually published the uh, the, di- the journals and also the book Yesterday's in Māori Land, uh, which was the source of inf- the original source of information where Māori actually became aware of all of these, had a, had a habit of sugarcoating. Uh, all of that, all, all of that quarter, all the all the practices of his of his of his papa, mm. and as a result of that project that started in 2017, that actually provided a lot more context and paved the way for our tupuna to actually come home. And then in 2020, uh, in June 2020, the new um, director for the Natural History Museum uh, signed with the approval of the Austrian government uh, the return for these tupuna to actually come home. So in a, in a nutshell, that is um, that is uh, that is uh, the, the the journey for these two, but it hasn't been easy, and it's and there have been a lot more people involved in this whole campaign um, that saw tomorrow. But you know, we also had the, had the quarter or after the party, we had a big breakfast and um, some speeches there, and we also mentioned Fanoma. This is only halfway points. Our kaupapa isn't finished until these two pana are actually home with you and your wahi tapu and your urupa back home with their whānau. So, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a big process that we can talk about a little bit further on in the podcast. And Amber can also shed a lot of light there around what's involved. Is there an expectation at the end of the institution that te papa or Aotearoa will pay to have our two pana back? Or is it is it understood that this is you know, what they have to do to make up for an atrocity that was done. Uh, when when Karanga Aotearoa was being developed, uh, the, the policy framework for Karanga Aotearoa actually had a few scopes and stipulations, and that was that we weren't, we weren't able to use our funding to buy our tūpuna because that wasn't, that wasn't appropriate. But our funding that we do actually get and this is probably what's helped contribute towards the, the favourable attitude to release our tūpuna to send them send them home. We we approach them, we tell them that we, we have the government mandate and, and support of our hapu whānau and iwi, uh, but we also let them know that we are only there to just talk about kō iwi and tūpuna and karapuna. Um, because once they, you know, if we approach them and say, it's like, oh, we're here, we're here for tonga as well, then they get a little bit nervous, ne? Aye. Slippery slope. A slippery, slippery slope. It's, 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 it's kind of like a dangerous territory when you can, like, you know, red flags start ringing for them. So, you know, right. like, you don't want that to happen. But we also, as another measure, um, tell them that, you know, if you, if you, 
if you do vote in favour of, of our claim and our, and our request, then we will cover any and all costs associated with um, uh, creating, uh, reboxing, undertaking audits, uh, export import permits, freight, uh, all of those logistics, and even, even as far as, and this is a very, very important part, even as far as sending over a delegation of Kaumatsua and Tohunga, Kia Parai Te Huarai, Kia Tukunasu, Nga Karanga, me Nga Karakia, a Morata Uma ko Ngaro, ko ngaro ki, ki Wahi Ke. And that's, 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 uh, that's a really important part for our, for our process is that on the journey home, we need to make sure that our tikanga is correct. Why are they reluctant? Why shouldn't why shouldn't they be reluctant? <laughs> you know, I think the museum attitudes, and I think Amber would actually talk about this a little bit more, is that you know, like the attitudes for towards um, towards claims for repatriation of any part of the collections is is this perceived risk? Is that you know, like oh, if we give this back, you know, what sort of precedent is gonna is it gonna set for everything else that we have in our museum? And I was like, Karema, you know, I think we're only really concerned about the stuff that's been stolen. But you know, they don't see that. They see it as a as a as a as a, a existential um, risk. Mm. Uh, to to their to their institutions and to their collections, um, mm. which is kind of understandable, but it's not actually a, an excuse that actually really sticks these days. Um, near Amber, mm. I I think there's um, for the most part things are changing, attitudes are changing, but there's still the view that. Um, museums are going to be empty spaces, it's going to open the floodgates and everyone's going to be lining up to get all their tonga and their tupuna back, um, which in a perfect world would be great, but, you know, in reality that's just not how it is. There are those that have, are of the view that it's a loss to science to have our, to have our tupuna returned and reburied for that matter. Uh, it's um, a loss of knowledge, places like... For instance, the British Museum, um, they see themselves as a universal museum, so they are there to tell the story of everybody. Um, and so museums like that um, are of the view that it is their duty to uh, retain Tonga and, in some cases, tupuna, whether it be um, Egyptian mummies or, or our own tupuna, because it's their, it's their obligation to help the world, help teach the world about the history of man. So there is very differing views, I think, around the world about the role of museums and what the right thing to do is these days. But, you know, there's a whole lot of um, amazing uh, Indigenous and um, and allies to the Indigenous. <laughs> yeah, that, I don't know, I guess are showing and teaching and educating the educated is kind of what I like to say, um, <laughs> that this is not scary. Um, and in fact, it's it's a way to create really meaningful relationships with the people whose tonga that they hold, you know, no longer are, well, in my view, are, are curators um, necessarily, the holders of that knowledge, um, you know, the, the ones that know everything about specific tonga or about specific cultures, um, it's actually the people. Mm. You know, they are the mm. ones with that mātauranga. Um, and, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a really changing landscape, museums. You know, we're not the only ones that are active in this space. Um, we have, you know, our whanaunga and uh, te whenua moe moea, who are also very active in this space. Our First Nations in the US and Canada, very active in this space. The Sami of Scandinavia, also very active in this space. And increasingly, um, our, our Ainu whanau in Japan, also becoming very active in this space as well. So, mm. I th- and Africa, the nations yeah. of Africa, you know, as we know, been in bronzes, um, you know, it's a very big kaupapa within the repatriation space at the moment. Um, and so I think that critical mass is building um, and museums are sort of understanding that it's not going to be a mass exodus of Taonga from yeah. within in their um Within their um, spaces, but you know, it's it's a, it's an opportunity to right the wrongs of those past of the past. You know, the the theft, the pillage, you know, the murdering in the name of science. Even if we want to go there, you know, and it, it's about building relationships and actually really learning about the Tonga that are within these spaces um, and and getting that story firsthand from the people. 
So it's, it's exciting. There are a lot of uh, shifts and changes that are happening in, in museums at the moment. And you know, like it's only been very, very recently mm. um, that these positive movements have, uh, have, have really happened. And like Amber touched on it earlier, and it's just all this understanding that, you know, curators and even institutions and museums themselves aren't, you know, they're, 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 they're not the, uh, the fountains of knowledge that, that, they, that they considered themselves to be. And that a lot of that mā tauranga about, you know, taonga, and, and especially tūpuna, mm. um, exists within the communities. But, you know, the, the whole conversation around taonga and tūpuna within museum collections is also quite different. Um, because... Tupuna don't belong in institutions. Tupuna don't belong um, are, are disconnected from disconnected from their fano. So that it becomes a it becomes an ethical question uh, for institutions on weighing up the measures between you know uh, the values to 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 science and civilization in general, but also what they actually mean to the communities uh, the communities of origin there and recon, rec, rec, reconciling that. <clears throat> For Māori ma, seems like a very, very logical way to actually think. It's like, no, they don't. They, 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 they don't belong to science, especially mm. in the situation when they're actually stolen mm. and taken without permission. And this is the, this is one of the actually it's a shitty thing, especially with Raishik. Mm. Um, he knew what he was doing. Mm. He knew exactly. He knew precisely what he was doing. He was very, very calculated about how he went about it, and we know this because you know, like he even uses terms like tapu and understanding that you know, like these are tapu, and even making references in his journals that you know, like to his mates saying it's like <clears throat> we can't be caught in the, in daylight, otherwise we'll be killed. Mm. You know, and so they understood. They understood that this was you know right, punishable yeah. by punishable by death. Mm. But um, very, 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 very crafty, and um, you know, um, uh, Kuroki uh, also gave him um, gave him permission to uh, to travel through the king country, and that's on the back of the relationship that was established by two Tupuna um, from Waikato. They travelled over to Austria on the Novara. Mm. And then they came back with the printing press, and their printing press printed the uh, printed the uh, the King King Itanga's, uh newspaper uh, during the uh, during the land wars, and so the the King Itanga thought quite highly of Austrians, and there was a there was a level of trust there, and Andreas uh, Andreas Reiche capitalised on that, and you know, mm. and they went through went through their fenua, shot all their shot all their birds, mm. and stole uh, stole their tupuna. Wow. See, that's quite an uncomfortable truth that I imagine you guys have to deal with as well, that it is um, oftentimes it was Māori who traded the koiwi, and as you said, it was whānau Māori that um, tipped them off as to the location of some wahitapu. Is there a process once you bring people home to, I guess, whakato with the tūpuna of the people who did the trading as well as the tūp- the, um, the descendants of the people who... Are receiving their ancestor home. Yeah, it can quite often be as difficult to have those local d- negotiations as much as hard as it is to have the discussions with it because it's a very very confronting situation. Oh. But the whole COPA before our program anyway is, is is reconciliation, is reconciliation of the past and inviting all of it. Because you know, like we 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 know that some whānau also have nawe amongst themselves and have to kind of go through a whole process and, and move move through those at their own pace. We also respect that as well, and so it's not out, not out, it's not. Our imperative to pressure Fano up and here we is like we have your tupuna, we brought them back, you need to take them back right now. You know. We'll help you, we'll help facilitate all of these discussions and you know, like wherever we can, we can mediate those those discussions, but quite often it's it's up to it's up to Fano Hapu and Iwi to make those decisions. And it could take months or it could take years, but you know, we're uh, we're patient because, you know, some of these claims with international institutions take, you know, twenty years, take ten years. It's very complex. Kia ora, I'm Alex Casey, Senior Writer at The Spin-Off. We wouldn't exist without the ongoing support of our generous members. If you're able to, you can make a donation at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Are you curious about how business can be better? 
I'm Simon Pound, and I host Business is Boring, a podcast where I caught it all with some of the most interesting people in entrepreneurship, commerce, and making things happen. Tune in to Business is Boring every Tuesday, brought to you by the Spin Off Podcast Network in partnership with Spark Business Lab. And what about, um, we talked a lot about Koiwi, but what about Taonga? I understand that, um, you know, there's obviously with particular Taonga, say if they're um, waka, they need particular conditions to be preserved in and not all iwi and hapu have those facilities to maintain and preserve their Taonga, um, you know, for generations to come. So how how are those negotiations, what are they like and how do you work with iwi and hapu who really want to bring their taonga home but might not have the facilities for them. Yeah, that's that's a, a, a new realm that I'm entering. Um, I'm also working with my own iwi to return um, a number of uh, taonga belonging to a whare um, and we're having those same discussions as well. Uh, it's hard because on the one hand, you know, you want to be able to um, ensure that these taonga are, are preserved for coming generations. But then at the same time, you know, is that is that the natural progression for taonga in general? Mm. And uh, I personally don't know that we should be applying those pressures or making um, those conditions, you know, part of that return. Like if, if, if we want to um, proactively preserve these taonga for, for generations to come, then I think by all means we should provide them with um, with those those skills, the, those, you know, the ability to do that and whether that is, you know, training or providing services through some of the um, avenues that we have here at Te Papa, um, then definitely. But then I think there's some iwi who they may not necessarily see that as important. They just want the tongue back. They want to put it in their marae mm. and – as, it lasts as long as it lasts, mm. um, and and we should be okay with that too. Yeah, so I, I, it's hard, it's hard that one because I think it's it's kind of double sided, and it depends on what that Fano and hap, Hapu want. You know, sometimes conditions of return, and and that has come into play with Koiwi too at times, um, is that they must be um, kept in a certain condition, otherwise we're not going to give them back. I don't really uh, – personally, I don't think we should be putting that on to our, our whānau. If that's what they want, then we support them to do that, but we shouldn't make that a condition of return. And uh, that's just my whakaro. I don't know if all museum people would uh, agree with that, but, um, mm. you know. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with it, even, even as far as, um, you know, the role for, for our programme anyway. Yeah. He waka. He waka mātou mō ngā tūpuna ki a hoki atu ki te wākāinga. And so our waka goes as far as the marae, or go as far as uh, where, wherever they want to have it. And then when we, when, when we return the tūpuna back to, back, back to their whānau hapu and iwi, it's completely up to them. It's entirely up to them around what they want to do or where they want to take their tūpuna. Some might take, want to take them back to the caves that they were taken from or those situations that may not actually be safe and so they might actually decide to take them somewhere else to an undisclosed location. So, you know, and it's... Ko tā mātou ki he, he, he tautoko i ngā, ngā hia hia, i ngā mea ngā wā o te, o, te, o te whānau. Yeah. How many are still out there? Ooh, that's a that's a that's a that's a one million dollar question there uh, <laughs> for for them. Um, we 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 have a fair idea on what we find as we go. So as we move through all of these different countries, you know, take take Germany for example, they'll they'll see that we are active in one part of Germany, and then a museum that actually knows that they might actually have some. They'll come forward and they'll say it's like. Um, we actually, and Amber's come through this in, in so many different situations and going to conferences, and it's like, we actually have uh, some some human remains from New Zealand uh, during this time, and we want to um, uh, uh, facilitate their journey their journey home, which is fantastic, you know, and it works out quite well for us, and then we start through that, that whole process. But, you know, at the moment, we're, um, we're, we're, we have on, on in the pipeline 
um, if I could even use that term, uh, about uh, 400 to 500 uh, koiwi and koiwi uh, to bring back. Wow. And mm. those are the only the ones that we know about. We you know, know that about. doesn't include, yeah. Amber knows, that doesn't include private collections. Mm. Who are the ones that are holding out on you? Who have you reached out to that has <laughs> said, absolutely not, you can't have these back? I'm not going to dig that hole. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Name and shame. Yeah, no, 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 because we actually are in delicate, delicate, um, delicate yeah, discussions with them. <laughs> but, you know, I, I do want... I do Start want some international relations issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're gonna, you're gonna <laughs> on cause the a, podcast. You're going you're gonna to cause a political incident. Um, <laughs> But no, um, you know, like uh, in the in the United Kingdom, we have had some made a lot of progress with uh, large and very very prestigious uh, institutions, uh, the Natural History Museum in London, uh, the Pitt Rivers Museum at Oxford University, Wellcome Trust, the University College of uh, Surgeons, um, Trinity College. So all all all, all of the, all of those all of those places, and even in Germany, all really really good. Um, but you know, you do have your 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 your, your tough nuts to crack and don't don't need to kind of like mention any names but you know like you, you <laughs> just kind of like need to think about who's actually making the headlines as far as being the most most resistant and so once you identify that museum or those museums then you understand it's like okay cool because if, if if they're difficult about talking with about Tonga then they're definitely difficult about talking about Kori Tonga to, um, mm. Kori and, and Toi Moko mm. without yeah. naming names like what kind of a <laughs> Person. Stop digging. No, no, I'm not. I just want to know sort of the ahua of a, a, of a person that might have um, things like that in a private collection. Like, why? What is the motivation? Why would someone, mm. why Why do people want koi we koi me taonga Māori in a private collection? What What do they get from that? Do you have any insight into that that mind? I, I think it's a bit of a <laughs> bit of a fetish, to be honest. Yeah. Um, right. You know, Good I, word. I, I've I've stalked certain um, well-known collectors, um, some of which have had TV programs about the fact that they collect um, human remains and human remains of all kinds. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I just think you know, people that have a lot of money like to collect things and sometimes they're beautiful things and sometimes it's weird and sometimes it's just plain wrong but you know we uh, I guess we have a, a inclination some people you know to be able to collect and the, the more rare the object or the or the tupuna mm. um the more they're worth and I think for me that is a worry um in terms of us bringing our tupuna home um and particularly for moko moko or toi moko we're, we've been really successful in bringing uh, those to a home. But, you know, then you have things like private collectors, the black market, where mm. the more we bring home, the less um, they are out there in the world and so the mm. more valuable Value they become. They have. Yeah. So that is, that's a concern for me and, and I don't really know how, how we deal with that. Um, and I guess it's just the hopes that the work that Karanga Aotearoa is doing um, to, I guess, educate those types of people to say that, you know, we are mm. a people who want our tupuna home and that we do not think they should be in collections, whether mm. they be private or public, um, that, you know, that you, that you, uh, you know, you, that you can touch, that you can, they can empathise with us. And, mm. you know, we have in the past have had private collectors contact us and want to return tupuna. So you know, wow. But it's a it's a hard one. It is yeah. a hard one. Yeah. Oh, there yeah. have been situations, and Amber's, Amber's mentioned it when um, when there are there are tupuna held within private collections, um, and these are tupuna that that you know people have inherited from estates, and then they discover the contents of these estates, and then they realise it's like oh shit. Um, 
Oh, imagine that as an inheritance. Mm. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you know, so it's you, more you, often than you think. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, was, I thought I was just getting some nice furniture, but you know, next mm. minute it's like, oh, hello, bones and mm. koiwi. So, but you know, like the, the thing that really, really helps with our with, with our mahi is that in, 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 in quite a lot of situations, we, we do do a lot of our high profile. Uh, work, um, especially over uh, with the Toymoka repatriation from the um, French uh, French museums uh, back in those days. There was so much, there was so much media activity, international media activity around those ones. Understand mm. that things are very difficult to get back from the French, um, and so you know, like there's a did the, 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 the news cycle. Mm. And so, you know, like we have people in, in the US actually seeing that and saying, it's like, you know, I've inherited this, um, this, this, this toimoku and mm. this, this, this head, and um, I want to um, do the right thing and, and give it back. So as far as private collections go, it, it really depends on who mm. owns who owns their private collection. Mm, mm. And just touching on the French, you know, for, for them, Taonga, and Tupuna, no matter where they're from, it's part of their mm. cultural, their uh, you know cultural history, their yeah. cultural heritage, yeah. and so they actually change the law, yeah. their law, so that only Toimoko or Mukumukai could come home, and so that's a big thing for for that country to change their. That's law. huge for France. Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, especially moving the definition because, like, you know, as Am- as Amber said, anything that's actually sits within uh, an institution like a museum that receives federal funding is everything is mm. property of the French Republic, mm. and it requires a you know um, a piece of legislation that goes through the upper and lower house in French in the French government for for them to actually come home. Just on that, just as we're wrapping up, I'm going to throw you both a really hard question. <laughs> what do you see as the future of many of these um, European institutions? You know, as you've touched on with the French, they see it as part of their identity. They're their Tonga. They're, I was reading something about, you know, there's a massive collection in Russia as well of Tonga Māori, and that's some of their attitude as well, that it's, well, they want to tell their history. So how? what do you see as... These institutions, what role can they play in your view or should they play at all? Should they give it all back and say, hey, it's up to the original countries to tell these narratives? Um, yeah, mm. how all koro or whakaro? Mm. Um, I mean, at the moment, Europe and I guess, well, I mean, maybe, maybe the whole world actually is going through uh, some really hard thinking about decolonising the museums and um, mm. I've been to a number of conferences over the years or pre-COVID um, where museums, particularly in Germany, are talking about decolonising that space and and for me that's really interesting because I, I'm asking, well, who's doing the decolonising if you're within the German space? You know, who is decolonising those museums and what does that mean? So I think museums in general are really looking at at their relevance, you know, what are they really there for? They're becoming a lot more open to creating meaningful relationships with the descendants of those Taonga and those Tupuna. You know, they want to, they actually are realising that they are not necessarily the holders of that knowledge. And actually they want to proactively start reconnecting those communities back with their Taonga and actually I guess it's a a, a mutually beneficial um, thing for the museums. Of course, they want to be able to tell that story um, and and put it in a wonderful exhibition. But actually, at the same time, they're actually proactively reconnecting those taonga back with those communities. And I think that's that's amazing. It's it's, it's never going to be the way that um, we as Indigenous peoples, I think, we want and we think should happen. Um, but there's definitely big movements happening um, and we need to be part of that conversation. You know, we need to go to these conferences. We need to be voicing our whakaro around how our taonga needs to be looked after and actually where they should reside. Yeah. Um, and people are starting to listen, which is am- which is amazing. And where they should reside, I feel like that's, that's really what I'm super interested in is like, well, if they're willing to tell our stories, but do they still want to tell our stories from the Austrian Museum. Mm. Um, what do you think, Te Arikirangi, sh- is it only necessary, like, do they need to be brought home for our stories to be told? Is that the end goal for you is to maybe dismantle in a way? <laughs> maybe not dismantle, that means you'd be out of a job. But to <laughs> to 
bring all of these taonga home and tell them from Aotearoa, not tell our stories from overseas? Um, I think, you know, you, you touched on something. Um, to be out of a job as far as repatriating Kauri Tangata is actually the goal. Uh, it, it's, a, it's actually the goal. We don't want to have to be keeping, we don't want to have to keep on searching for our tupuna to actually bring them home. But, you know, I think as... Museums are at a very, very interesting time at the moment. It's a bit of a tipping point for them because they're, they're, they're having to kind of like really look at themselves because there's been a lot of social change that has happened over the last five to ten years. And they're, they're actually exploring their relevance within their communities, within their nations and within the world in general. And mm. a lot of that, a lot of the traditional structures for museums is actually dis- disintegrating underneath all of these cultural and social pressures there, and that involves all of the campaigning that indigenous communities are doing. My hope for the future, and I think this is where Germany's, you know, and like who. Who ever thought that we were going to be looking at Germany for examples uh, for where where the mu- where the museums are actually heading? But they're actually really really good, and the thing about them is that they're actually quite methodical in the way that they actually approach things. First, they're looking at um, at, at any uh, taonga and um, collections from the colonial context, and they're reaching out to those uh, to those different communities uh, that are connected to those and bringing them into the museum and developing those relationships and the future for those particular relationships is actually a sharing partnership between Taonga going home so that they could be reinterpreted or in other situations the Berlin Ethnographic Museum um, has also done gone through a process of actually bringing in Pacific waka carvers to actually make um, make a, make a, make waka for their for their exhibition spaces, which creates an avenue for them to actually send the waka that they had in their collections back home. And so there's this really oh. interesting movements of so um, of things that's happening over in Germany. And so you know what, you know, hit the mm, hands, mm. Hit, hats off to the Germans. Mm, mm. <laughs> right. Yeah, no matter what these discussions with museums. Um, they know that repatriation or returning mm. of Tonga is part of that conversation. Yeah. They know they can't engage with communities without having that conversation as well, which is, you know, which is great. In the past, they were too scared to even broach that because they didn't want to bring up the repatriation court at all. Mm. I can imagine it must be a really heavy, delicate process. But, yeah, amazing the work that you're both doing in this space to, to bring our people home. And hopefully empty out more museums overseas. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> hey, well, um, tēnei te mihi nunui ki a kōrua. Um, ngā mihi mō kōrua mā tauranga. Me te kaha o tō mahi te whakahoki um, i o tātou tipuna ki Aotearoa anō. Tēnei te mihi me atu ki a kōrua. Kia ora. Kia ora. Tēnā koutou. Well, that's near for another fortnight. A uh, big mihi anō to our guests, Te Ariki Rangi, Mamaku Ironside and Amber Aranui, both hard-working, incredible kaimahi at Te Papa doing the hard yards to bring our people home. Um, mihi to my co-hosts, Leonie Hayden and Te Kuru o Te Marama Jews. And, of course, to Te Ahe Butler, who's here with us every fortnight, stitching all of our great kōrero together and making it sound Rawe. Kapai, um, you can listen to our podcast anywhere where you listen to your podcast, Spotify, Apple, and we'll be back in another fortnight with another juicy episode for you to get your taringa stuck into. Hey, aku and nei. Nair is public interest journalism funded through New Zealand On Air and brought to you by the Spin Off Podcast Network. It was hosted and researched by Leonie Hayden with Te Kuru Jews and Mediana Johnson. Nair was produced by Te Aihe Butler with senior production from Jane Yee and project management from Mark Kelleher. Kia ora, this is Toby Manhire here to urge you to tune in to Gone by Lunchtime, a podcast with me, Annabelle Lee Mather and Ben Thomas tackling the world of New Zealand politics, from policy to polling, from scandal to psychodrama. Listen to Gone by Lunchtime, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network, wherever good pods are sold. Kia ora e te iwi, te Aihe Butler here, podcast manager at The Spin-Off. If you enjoy listening to our podcasts, consider supporting our mahi by signing up to become a Spin-Off member at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. 
The Spin-Off Podcast Network.